the Hunter Farmer Diet Solution. We're going to be talking about this book and uh, how you actually may use some of this information here to more easily lose weight this summer. So welcome, Dr. Bonus. Thanks, CJ. Great to be here. So um, I've got to tell you, uh, we were talking earlier in the show, I've been, uh, about four years ago, I weighed about 20 pounds over the weight that I had. And as I said to you earlier, I weighed 125 pounds my entire life, no matter how much I ate. I was kind of blessed. I don't know, but I could, I'm kind of blessed and cursed because I never learned how to eat correctly. And uh, I tried vegan diets, I tried fasting diet, and then finally the diet that worked for me was one in which I was eating a ton of protein, not a ton, a lot of carbs, and uh, got myself unfixated from carbs. And so I, I was thinking that it was related to your book, The Hunter Farmer Diet Solution, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about diets and why certain diets work for some people and why diet, some diets don't work. So that's my first question. Let's hear your thoughts well, I mean, on that. Good, I mean, first of all, your experience is very common, CJ, and that is people like you have the same experience, that their weight was never a problem until a certain time in their life, and then all of a sudden they start to gain. And, you know, they struggle, and that is they don't understand why they're starting to gain weight, and they don't have much success in trying to take it off. Mm -hmm. And like most people, they'll try all the different things that they're, they can try. You know, right. people try, you know, a gluten-free diet. They'll try going, you know, paleo. They will try doing, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, cut out a, a dairy or, or some other food group. And some will have success with that and some won't. And, you know, we've been working with people uh, with their weight for about 30 years. And yeah. our experience has been similar. And that is that different people respond differently to different approaches. Mm -hmm. And so to really get the best results, what's important is matching the right dietary plan with the right person. Right. And so if people understand how they should eat based on their body and its metabolism, it really makes it easier on you. In other words, you don't have to struggle trying six or eight or ten different diets. You have a strategy that you know will work best for you. Okay, and that's based on the idea in your book, The Hunter-Farmer Diet Solution, is whether you're a hunter or a farmer. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a hunter and farmer. It's not your personality. Like, are you no, aggressively just killing terms. meat? Or? It's just terms. It's not something that's, uh, you know, it's not like the hunter's a carnivore and yeah. the farmer's a vegetarian. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, those terms are just to help people remember what their metabolism it does, how it works, and what that means about how they should eat. Mm -hmm. So I think, for example, about the historical hunter, you know, which we all were until about 12,000 years ago because the very first crop that humans had was wheat started growing 12,000 years ago. So mm -hmm. before that, for the 183,000 years before that, we were all hunters. Right. But not just hunters, I'd say hunter-gatherers, you know, where yeah. if we could kill an antelope, we would eat it, or if we couldn't catch it, we might try to, you know, catch a bird or hook a fish or something. But if yeah. we couldn't get that, you know, we'd have to go forage. We would find some, you know, roots, berries, fruits, nuts, whatever we could find, you know. And that was what all of us did until about 12,000 years ago when the very first crop was grown in, in central Iraq. And so um, the idea of the hunter is that uh, those people have a different kind of metabolism. It's a much uh, more, uh, it's a metabolism that's more uh, successful in more stressful areas. Uh, it's really the kind of metabolism that helps people to survive especially in different and difficult environments. So, for example, if you were living in the desert or if you were living in the tundra or if you had a high mountain, you know, home or if you were living uh, like the Inuit, for example, up in, uh, you know, Alaska and near the North Pole, uh, they've ha inhabited these very difficult, challenging environments. And that's the environment where the so-called hunter metabolism really thrives. Uh, in places of abundance where there's a lot of food, a lot of crops, a lot of, you know, uh, access to uh, a variety of foods, that's where the farmer metabolism really thrives. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the two, which most people, unless they read the book, don't really understand, but I'll explain, has to do with how sensitive someone is to the effects of the hormone insulin. You know, insulin is the hormone that we all have that our pancreas makes to help us to process the food that we eat. Okay. And here's how it works. Um, 
when we eat food, that food goes in our stomach. The stomach grinds it up into its little break, you know, broken down byproducts, and then those little components get absorbed in the intestine, mm -hmm. and then they're in the bloodstream. And so the food that we eat within two hours is now out of our stomach and into the blood. Perfect. Now to get the food out of the blood and into the cells where it works, that's where insulin comes in. Okay. Insulin is the hormone that moves the food from the bloodstream into our cells where it provides energy. Okay. And so with uh, these two types, the hunter and the farmer, the hunter type responds in a very sluggish way to insulin, meaning after a meal they release insulin, but it really is slow to work. And as a result, the food is very slow to leave the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And so the hunter type uh, has a very long duration of food in the bloodstream. And here's where that's important. And the, and the farmer is the opposite, a very quick clearance of the food. So very rapidly after eating, that food is already processed in the cells, stored. It's no longer in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And that's because the farmer is very sensitive to the effects of insulin. Okay. And that difference of being either uh, not so sensitive, we call resistant to insulin, or quite sensitive, is something that we're born with. It's uh, a function of two things really. Um, our parents, because they give us the genes that really create our metabolism, mm -hmm. and, but it also has to do with um, our birth. Um, what we know now is that the trait for the hunter is something that Mother Nature gives us to help us to survive in difficult environments. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to have a child, for example, and the child was born, you know, in, in California, uh, chances are that child will grow up to be a farmer. And that's because the living is good in California. There's an abundant food supply. Your baby should be nourished quite well through the pregnancy and so should be delivered with a nice healthy metabolism. And that would be very typical. Now, if you lived in southwest Arizona, the situation might be very different. And that's because in southwest Arizona, food is tough. There's a desert there. Uh, they can grow very little crops. There's not a lot of farming. It's a subsistence kind of existence where uh, people have to live on, you know, cactus and, you know, small little pieces of, of crops and the animals that they can catch. And so it's a different environment, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And interesting, in southwest Arizona, the people are programmed for the hunter type. They're insulin resistant. Now, here's some way that you can really understand that for you. Uh, for example, when people wake up in the morning, some people wake up and they have to go eat. They're hungry. Mm -hmm. They really have an appetite. And the first thing on their mind is, let's get some breakfast. Right. Uh, right. Some other people, when they wake up in the morning, they're just not hungry. Yep. Yep. And, and, and those people should not eat breakfast. Hmm. Because hmm. what we've learned, and this is a real fallacy, you've probably heard it before, that... You know, if you want to lose weight, make sure you eat breakfast. Right, it's, eat the most breakfast. Im it's the most important meal yeah, of yeah. the day. Right, it really right. gives you your energy and it you know, evens your blood sugar. And it turns out that's uh, an old wives' tale. Mm -hmm. And that is if you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry for breakfast and yet you eat it because you're, quote, supposed to, you'll end up eating more that day than if you waited until you were hungry to have your first meal. And that's if you're a hunter. And the reason is with the hunter... The clearance of food is so slow that when the hunter wakes up in the morning, they still have dinner in their system from last night. Mm -hmm. And so they're not hungry because they're still processing the food that they had for dinner. Oh. And so they wake up in the morning, their blood sugar is 106, 107, 108. They're not hungry. That doesn't really hit until maybe noon or 1 or 2 in the afternoon. And so the idea that we're supposed to eat a good breakfast really doesn't apply to the hunter type. Mm -hmm. So my advice for people trying to lose weight is first, if you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry for breakfast, please don't feel compelled to eat it. It would be a mistake. You'd actually be better off waiting until you were hungry to have your first meal. Most of the breakfast that we have, you know, you've got cereal, you've got oatmeal, you've got toast, you've got bagels, you've got waffles, pancakes, croissants. I mean, most of that is grain. Yeah, and, you know, that might be fine for your kids because your kids are likely to be farmer kids who do well with grain, but not for the hunter child.
And there's, again, two ways that someone could be this hunter type. Uh, one, they have uh, two parents that are the hunter type because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In other words, if your parents were the pre-diabetic or diabetic type, it's more likely that you will be that way. Uh, but the other thing is your birth, actually, that can program you in that direction. And this is something that people don't know, uh, and that is it's little babies that grow up to become the diabetic adults. Uh, if a baby was born in this country for whatever reason, less than six and a half pounds, uh, for example, maybe they were premature, or they might have been uh, one of a twin pregnancy, or perhaps mom smoked, and that's, you know, reduced the size of the baby. Or it might have been a baby that was just small, SGA, small for gestational age. Any of those reasons uh, where a baby might be born below six and a half pounds actually programs that infant to be diabetic during their adult life. Realize that. So even though my dad was diabetic, he, he grew up in China where I think probably yes. the situation was little food during that time. I was he born... a small baby growing yeah. up. I was a small baby. I think I was six and a half pounds, so I'm just on the edge right of... the border. Yeah, but, so even though my dad had diabetes, I was... Were you the first child in your family? Second child. Second. Yeah, I, what I find is the second and first child usually know their weight. The third one, you're lucky if you have a picture. Your <laughs> 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 totally parents are so tired. <laughs> yeah, look, I don't know. You were born sometime, somewhere, some weight. <laughs> Okay, so it's hard to tell. So even though I had a diabetic dad and he died of a heart attack, right? So yes. he probably he was, was the a hunter. classic hunter. Okay. And you know, hunter type is the type that's prone to diabetes. Mm. And here's what's interesting: what people don't realize, you know, if someone becomes diabetic as an adult, a lot of people would say, "Oh, that's because they didn't eat well, or they ate too much sugar, or they became overweight." Uh, none of those are the case. Uh, those people are born. With the trait for diabetes, uh, either genetically or through this birth history. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you've seen that show called The Biggest Loser, a TV show. Yes. Yeah. Where you know people that are quite overweight compete to lose the most weight. Right. And um, interestingly, even though these people are extremely overweight, if you talk to the show's doctor, uh, only about half are either diabetic or pre-diabetic, meaning. Half of these, you know, very overweight people are don't are not even pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. So it's really about early life. Oh, it's the birth history and it's the genetics that program us that way. It's not what we eat. Right. So then, my 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 husband probably is a. Is it fair to say that most people in you know born in in the United States when it was flush with food for, you know, that they're probably, most of us here in the U.S. are farmers. I mean, uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, right now, statistically in the U.S., 40% of the population is the hunter category, meaning 40% of Americans will become diabetic during their lives. Because they were, pre, they were born during a time of food scarcity during that well, time? There's a high, let's say there's a very, there's a lot of diabetes around. Mm -hmm. And the reason that there's so much diabetes, and especially here in this country, um, so many more people have died from starvation mm -hmm. than from diabetes. Um, obesity has only killed a few thousand. Starvation has killed millions. And so these genes are there to help us to survive through tough times when food is scarce. Right. Yeah, it really helps us because, you know, if food is scarce and you have to go find some, you need two things. One, you need some energy to go do that. And two, you need a little smarts. You know, you need your brain working. Right. And that's what the glucose does because the brain is the only part of our body that can't burn protein or fat for energy. It can only use glucose. And so that's the reason that... Uh, so many people are programmed for uh, for this type 2 diabetes in our country, uh, and that's because of the long uh, history of food, the food supply. I see. So that a hunter person would be, because they store, as I recall from your book, from the hunter farmer, they're actually star storing fat in their stomach because, as you said, it takes them heart longer time to digest that food purposely right. because who knows when their next meal will so come. So true. Yeah. Their eating was more sporadic. You know, for example, the hunter would kill an antelope and they would eat it. They might not eat for two more days, but right. that's the way the hunter's metabolism yeah. works. Right, and it would be burned off of the fat in their stomach, so they're not going to starve. 
Sure, exactly. So, and it's ready access to this energy that they have. And so that's a very different kind of metabolism than people who, you know, are putting fat on here under the skin, uh, we call subcutaneous fat. And those people, the, the farmer people, tend to get larger, you know, in, they just they expand in all directions, whereas the hunter type is really expanding around the middle. Yeah, and one of the things I love in your book is that you said, if your waist size has remained the same, even though your gut is hanging out of your pants, you're probably a hunter. That's yeah, to it's true. Yeah. I mean, I also tell people, look at what kind of clothes you normally buy. You know, if, you're, if your weight is going up and you're buying shirts, you're probably the hunter. You know, if you're buying pants, you're probably the farmer. <laughs> I love it. Okay, we have Dr. Mark Lufonis here talking about um, his book, The Hunter Farmer Diet Solution. All right, so I had my scared straight moment by a doctor who um, I was, I told you I reached this point where I couldn't lose weight and didn't know what to do. And so I went to this program, one of those introductory programs. And this, and this gentleman threw up a bunch of charts. And I was like, here's all these things that you're going to encounter in your old age, diabetes, you know, cancer, heart attacks, you know. And he said, and all this can be changed if you just eat better. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die if I continue eating this way. I'm going to die earlier or I'm going to have a life in which I'm taking thousands and thousands of different pills to deal with blood pressure and all these different things. And uh, it was a scared straight moment. I'm glad that I had it. Um, but it's kind of shocking to me how much of our health is related to our weight. It seems like a yeah, duh, but I'm shocked at the medical issues that come up. So I wanted to talk to you about, you know, a little bit about that in terms of um, is this something that someone should be kind of aware of and conscious of and uh, what the medical findings you're, you're getting? Because um, I know you've been studying this throughout your, through your career, what you're now finding is some new info. Yeah, I mean, food is some place where people really tend to beat themselves up, and you know they're always worried. You know, if they're doing the right thing, and you know, if they if they eat the wrong thing, they feel guilty, and they start, you know, uh, you know, it's terrible. So, you know, that fear-based place to is not a sustainable place to really uh, work from, and that is, you know, the fear only lasts keeps us on track so long, and then we just throw in the towel. I mean, it'd be better to do it because you felt great and you loved it, and it was a delicious way to eat and you find that you didn't have to worry so much if occasionally you want to have the cookie, for example. So, you know, I think working from a place where you feel good, where your health is excellent, where the payoff is in, you know, the feel good as opposed to the fear, you know, <laughs> I think it's better. So you don't scare straight, you're, you don't do a scared straight moment and you're like, you're going to die, you're going to die if you don't eat this way. <laughs> you know, fear can motivate, but it doesn't sustain, you know, yeah. it doesn't sustain. Yeah. Okay, so what are you finding now? Because I know you've been studying this area for a while. What are some new findings that you're getting? Well, what we're finding is that, you know, different people have different kinds of metabolism, meaning the way that they process food is very different. Some people process it very quickly. Other people take a long time to process it. Right. Some are prone to diabetes and more problems with their heart and, and, and potentially blood pressure. Right. Others have more concerns with cancer. And these are actually two different kinds of people. And, you know, for me as a doctor, that's nice to know. Yeah. Because if you're going to have a heart attack, I'd rather know so I know what to prevent. <laughs> if you're going to get diabetes, boy, that, I'd love to know it. You know, right. if you're going to get cancer, I know what tests to do to find it. So right. um, it's helpful to know how your body works because then you really have a heads up about what to predict yeah. and what to prevent. I mean, that's really why we're doing this. We want to live the longest, happiest, healthiest lives that we can. Yeah. And yeah. eating right is the foundation of that. Yeah. Now, everybody knows, you know, we're not supposed to be eating junk food and too much processed food and fatty foods. And, but the question is, is, you know, can we do even better? Right. In other words, yeah, staying away from the, the goody aisle is one thing. But... Right. Can we even be healthier? And and the answer is yes. If you know how your metabolism works. Right. If you're a hunter or a farmer, you're going to eat different kinds of things that work sure. well with your metabolism. So let's say that you're a hunter, which means that you store more um, energy. And uh, I guess it means that you are processing the insulin. Is that right? It's more slowly? It's a, very slow, it's a very slow processing of the food. The hunter type. 
has higher insulin, but also higher blood sugar, higher levels of, of some forms of, of fats like triglycerides. So they have a lot of the food in their blood for longer after right. a meal. Right. Versus and, you know, I'll give you an example. The, you know, the, that, right? the best way of really teasing out whether someone is a hunter or a farmer is a very simple test. Um, and that is by drinking a drink, a fixed dosage of sugar. Uh -huh. And then by checking the blood every 30 minutes to see how long it takes you to clear out that much sugar. And there are norms for that. Yeah. So we know that the hunter type takes more than two hours to process the sugar from a single drink. And just so you know, it's 75 grams of glucose. So that would be 300 calories in one drink. Right. So we give 300 calories of sugar. We check the blood every 30 minutes, and the hunter type takes more than two hours to process those wow. 300 calories. Yeah. Well, how does one take that test? I mean, first of all, I'm not going to chug a case of beer. That's what I'm hearing for those out there who go, oh, the doctor told me to go drink so I can take a test. Okay, so I'm going to be drinking the, the smaller amount and then measuring. But how do I measure? How am I measuring my glucose levels? How does one do that? Do I go to um, Bartels or the drugstore and get a glucose test? How, does, how do I get that? Some people do that. You know, now they have these little portable um, uh, glucose testers. Oh. Uh, and when you buy one, and they're very inexpensive, I think they cost about uh, 15 bucks. I know I bought one on Amazon not long ago for, for about that much. Wow. And they come with some of these little test strips. And uh, a lancet so that you can do a little pin prick with a sterile uh, needle and get a little drop of blood and then the little meter will give you your blood sugar reading and if uh, you read the instructions you can actually learn how to test your own blood sugar I mean normally it's done at your doctor's right but I'm doing this pin prick uh, over two hours for every ha half hour every 30 minutes yeah every 30 minutes so okay. the idea would be you would drink 300 calories yeah I you like would that do part a pin prick blood sugar test every yeah. 30 minutes until your blood sugar reached the level that you started out at in other words you have to get a baseline test right and you drink the drink Every 30 minutes until the blood sugar is back down to where it started. Okay. And if that takes see. longer than two hours, that's the hunter. That's the cheapest and easiest way for you to figure out. Very, that. Well, that's, that's one, one way to do it, and it's the most uh, important because that really tells us the most important thing, and that is how long does sugar last in your system. Uh, there's another way to do it, actually, which doesn't involve any bloodletting. You might be interested. <laughs> yes. And that is with a tape measure. You can do a simple test with a tape measure that's very uh, instructive around this. Okay. Uh, you'll need two measurements. The first measurement is what we call the waist measurement. And that's taken uh, at the level of the belly button. So if you take the tape measure around the belly button, you'll get that measurement, which should be uh, sort of your smallest middle measurement. Right. And then you'll want the hip measurement, which is taken right where those two bones stick out. Okay. And that would be your biggest bottom measurement. Okay. So you divide the waist by the hips. Right. And if you're less than 0.8, then you're the farmer. Oh. Okay. If you're well, more than 0.8. I was 0.8, 0.71 at my fattest, so that means I'm a... You were what? I'm sorry? I was 0.71 at my hip too. 0.71, so well below 0.8. Yeah. And that would be in the farmer right. category. And what that means is, I mean, your hips are bigger than your waist. Yeah. And that's very typical for the farmer pattern. Oh, I see. And you'll be interested to know, um, in today's world, that's a better pattern. Um, it's actually associated with about five years longer lifespan, which is nice for you. Wait, no, my husband, though, would men, because men usually have that kind of stick bone kind of thing. Would, for men, they also have this 0.8 ratio uh, for men, the number is a little different. It's 0.9. Okay. Uh, and that's that ma mainly because, you know, women have wider hips for childbirth. So right. men don't have that. So the men get an extra tenth. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah but what that. that means is if a guy's belly is bigger than his butt, he's going to be in the hunter side. Um, but there are a lot of guys very even. I mean, if you check me, I come out right at, at 0.9. I'm sort of right on the border. Um, so um, it's important to do that measurement for each person. You know, it's Wait, so you're helpful. Point nine, does that mean you're a farmer or a hunter? For me, that's right on the borderline. So right on the borderline. Uh, and there are people that are just on the border. In other words, they are not either the hunter or the farmer. And statistically, you know, right now, CJ, in the U.S., about 40% of Americans are 
the hunter type, mm -hmm. about 35% are the farmer type, mm -hmm. and about 25% would be a mix. I see. Um, oftentimes that's because they might be the product of what we call a mixed marriage, and that is, let's say, a hunter, father, farmer, mother, uh -huh. and where does the child end up? You know, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And so it's important to get that measurement, and that's valid, by the way, at any age once someone's reached adulthood at age 20. Okay, got so you're a combo then. I, I would be a combo, and you know, uh, statistically, depending on where uh, you live in the world, the chances of being a hunter or a farmer will vary. Yeah, you know, here. a year ago, I was actually in Iraq where uh, farming started. Uh, the first farm was in Sumeria, yeah. uh, you know, the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Yes. You probably remember reading about that. It's, you know, the breadbasket of the world where bread, you know, wheat was really grown for the first time. And when I was doing the measurements there, I found about 80% farmers, much more farmers there. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, and in places like Arizona, Southwest Arizona and Central America and Latin America, uh, a lot more hunters. Yeah, yeah. I think about a, a cowboy and I think about those Egyptian um, hieroglyphics. You never saw there someone you like this. You no, always no saw butt, no hips, yeah, exactly. Kind of so right thing. about that. It's interesting you mention that because um, a patient of mine is an archaeologist working in Egypt, and he's studying the diets of the pyramid builders. You know, they found them in mummies, and they open up their stomachs to see what they were eating, and it turns out they were eating mostly meat. What? Yeah, That's it's fascinating. It's fascinating. That's shocking. Okay, we have Dr. Uh, Laponis, who's a New York Times bestselling author, and we're talking about his book, Hunter Farmer Diet Solution. We're getting lots of questions from listeners out there on the radio show that want to know how to determine. We were asking for shortcuts, and one was the blood test where you drink how many grams? 75? 75 grams. So yeah. sh of sugar. What is that at? Like one 300 glass of calories, wine? 300 calories. How much, what's that in terms of like, what's that approximately? Like one glass of wine or? No, that'd be more. I mean, it would be, for example, um, almost like a can of Coke, for example. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm, uh, you are a fun doctor. I'm getting a can of Coke's <laughs> worth of wine. Yes! Okay. You know, and by the way, you know, you're talking about the diet solution, but, you know, people should know it's not really a diet. You know, it's not yeah. like you read the book and this is a diet of things, you know, this is what you eat. It's more of a way of thinking about how to yeah. eat for your metabolism. It's more of a solution than it is a diet. Yeah, I, I hear you. So then the other test um, for this solution to figure out how you eat is actually looking at your waist divided by your hip and then actually looking at, it's called the waist to hip ratio. So, yeah. for example, if I had... Or the belly to butt ratio, if you prefer. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So the waist is measured at your belly button, yeah. and your hip is measured at your hip bone, where you're actually the widest part of your butt, I assume. Right. And then you're actually looking at the ratio. So you take your waist divided by your hip. So let's say you had a 28-inch 28, 28 waist, and a 30-inch 30, 30 waist, and a 36-inch bum. Um, that would equal what we said, I think we said that was 0.83, right? In that particular case, um, that if you're a man, right, you'd have to, you would be a... Less than 0.9, uh, so than that 0. would 9. be farmer. Right. And if you're, and let's say that you're 30, 38 inch uh, waist and 36 well, That would be 0. 0.78, that would be farmer for a woman. Yep. So that's how you, folks out there, we got some questions on how you calculate it, but that's how you calculate it. So either you can drink a Coke's worth of, of wine. I like that option as much. Well, you know, wine, wine you can't drink because it's not just calories. There's yeah. also alcohol. Okay, what should and I drink? alcohol will affect the blood sugar reading. So it's got to be just a source of pure sugar. A Coke is a better choice than the wine. Sorry. Uh, okay, so just drink a, drink a Coke. Uh, just for this test. I mean, that's not something that people should be drinking, to tell you the truth. <laughs> no, I know, but for the test, take a take a, a Coke can of Coke, Coke can, not bottle of Coke, and then actually prick yourself every 30 minutes and get a blood test from um, your drugstore. Uh, you can also do it with your doctor, because they know how to do this. It's called the glucose tolerance test, okay. by the way. How do you tolerate glucose? Yeah, and someone said if you're exactly at point eight or exactly at point nine, that means you're a combo, which means yeah. you probably had a... a, a a mother or father that were a farmer and a hunter. Yeah, the so-called mixed marriage, sure. Mixed marriage. Or, you know, there are some cultures where it's much more common to have that type, like the Mediterranean cultures. Right. Uh, they seem to be more on that ratio. They don't really vary that much. So, you know, there's some genetics involved here. Yeah. Okay, so now the next question is what, if we want to have the solution, what 
what kind of things do you eat if you're a hunter and what kind of things do you eat and how do you eat and what kinds of things? You talked about breakfast. Like if you're a hunter, don't eat breakfast if you're not hungry because you're probably still digesting the food from last night. But what kinds of food should you eat? Well, you know, as you know, the two big, you know, categories of losing weight in terms of diets would be the low carb diet or the low fat diet. I mean, that's what people are really out there trying. They're cutting carbs, they're cutting fat, trying to get better results. And, you know, whether you should cut carbs or cut fat depends on your metabolism. Mm -hmm. If you're the hunter type, you should cut carbs. If you're the farmer type, you should cut fat. Mm -hmm. And that's what people need to understand, and that is it depends on your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And you don't choose your metabolism. It sort of gets chosen for you, you know, partly by virtue of your parents, uh, but also by virtue of your birth history, because that can program us one way or the other. Right. Uh, and by the way, if you're still confused with this measurement, the waist and hip ratio, mm -hmm. there is some more information on the website, which is hunterfarmer.com or hunterfarmerdiet.com. In fact, okay. there's a quiz there that you can take that has 18 questions that you can answer one way or the other, and it will tally a score for you automatically and tell you likely which category you're in. Right. And so that might combo, right? It will it tell you if you're a combo too? It does, it does, because then the score is going to be in the middle. Okay. So you don't have to get the book, but I would suggest getting the book regardless. Because I have Well the book also gives you more information about, you know, what you should be understanding and how to eat and recipes too, because you know, what do I have for lunch? Goodness, you know, do I make a chili or do I have pasta? You know, or do right. I have a slice of pizza or a sandwich or should I go and get, you know, some, you know, chicken? Yeah. And so it helps people to understand what they should be considering, at least, for their food. So let's talk about portions, because I'm basically a farmer, and it seems like I have um, some portion. And I bet a lot of people out there are mostly farmers. Um, well, farmers, sure, uh, predominate in the U.S. Yeah. And um, with the portions, you know, the farmer, unfortunately, uh, has this problem, and that is they are struggling with a higher level of appetite, mm -hmm. the more appetite, and... Uh, more problems with low blood sugar and they've already figured out how to solve that and that is you know whenever you get around food eat as much as you can as fast as you can you know exactly. that's the solution. get yeah. that blood sugar back up you know and so you know you go out to a restaurant with them and they got their hands in the rolls before the waiters exactly. even take exactly I'm there that's me no because you're so hungry by the yes. time you get to dinner and your blood sugar is so low you gotta eat three rolls to get the blood sugar back up yeah. And so you know you've gone out to dinner with farmers when, you know, there's no more rolls left and you have to have <laughs> more, more rolls before the drink horse is taken. <laughs> All um, right, so so, so, so that's, that's the farmer type is they're always struggling with appetite and trying to manage low blood sugar. But instead of, you know, being a vacuum cleaner and eating everything in sight, you know, one uh, nice thing to learn uh, if you're the farmer is eating more slowly and just grazing. In other words, taking a bite of something every hour, whether you need it or not, because if you have a bite of something in a, you know, every hour, the blood sugar never is allowed to drop. So it doesn't get into that range where you're so ravenous that you're going to you know, bite your fingernails. Okay, but what's the portion? Because I, 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 when you say eat all the time, I think, okay, I'm just going to have a fistful of chicken every, <laughs> every hour. It's grazing, you know, it's not constant gorging. It's, you know, it's grazing. That's what people have okay, to learn. Are there any, like, you know, when I was remember they said like, use a deck of cards. What's the kind, is there a kind of portion control for how much a, a farmer should eat? Well, here's an example. You know, let's say you have a cracker. Uh -huh. You know, a cracker, you know, one cracker is roughly 20 calories. Right. Uh, 20 calories lasts for roughly 15 minutes. If you think that we burn between one, one and a half calories per hour during waking hours, that means a cracker is going to last you for about 15 to 20 minutes. Right. That's what you should think about in terms of eating, and that is if you had a cracker's worth of grain, you know, every half an hour or so, you'd be fine. Okay. And then you could still eat a small meal. You wouldn't be ravenous. You wouldn't have to eat the wrapper on, you know, what it is that you have. I get it. Okay. All right, so I get it. To manage the appetite and right. prevent overeating. Right. It's almost I'm thinking I have this vision of me being a little engine with a fuel, right? And and if it's just that you get I don't have to, I can I can eat just a little bit, but I'm not trying to like over you know, go past the fuel gauge. Don't have the gas me. overflowing out gas the gas. Overflowing. That's what happens to me. Okay, so there are a couple of other questions from um, callers on the radio show. Sure. What do you think of Plexus Slim? 
what is plexus slim? I assume it's some type of diet. I don't know because that that's a product, I guess, that somebody is, okay. is um, you know, manufacturing. That honestly, I don't have any experience with, so I can't say. Okay, so the doctor said to keep a drink or snack handy. What is that called? Hypo or hyper? Well, if there's a drink or snack handy, that means there's a farmer type because they really need something because their blood sugar is going to drop. Right. And if that's what we're talking about, then the best thing to have on hand would be some kind of grain. Yeah. Uh, we love granola bars because, you know, a little granola bar, we hand make them here, they're delicious. Um, they've got about 150 calories, but when you get the granola bar and you're, you know, hungry, you don't have to eat the whole thing. You have a bite, and then we teach people to wrap it up again, stick it back in your pocket, you know, <laughs> because that's what grazing is all about. It's right. not about everything in the package, it's about having a bite and having a little bit for later, uh, you know, so that's a really important thing. And the, uh, book, and the book actually has a bunch of recipes on the Hunter sure. Farmer Diet Solution, and the back there... There, in fact, is a recipe for the granola, I think. It's an excellent recipe. I love those. It looks so good. Or yeah. Someone asked, what if you're on a low salt situation? Ah, good question. You know, with low salt, and again, low salt is generally going to be more of an issue for the hunter types because they're going to be more prone to hypertension. Mm -hmm. They're going to have more problems with cardiovascular disease. They're going to be the ones that really need to be careful about salt. Uh, but what you'll read in the book, which is interesting, not everyone is salt sensitive, and it doesn't... Uh, align according to hunter or farmer mm -hmm. and that is some people have the ability to excrete salt some not so much mm -hmm. and so what we've learned is is if you eat salty food but you can't pee out the sodium then your blood pressure is going to go up mm -hmm. on the other hand some people are not salt sensitive they can eat salt and when they do they pee out extra sodium their urine becomes salty and that's the person who really doesn't have to be careful about salt or salt uh, restriction okay, so yeah. Some One thing you might know, uh, some people notice, you know, if I have salty food, I'll notice my rings get tight yes, I or think. my socks start cutting into my ankles a little bit or I feel puffy yes. and that's the person who's retaining fluid from salt. They're not excreting it. Oh, so sure. if that's you, whether you're the hunter or the farmer, you should be careful about sodium intake. Uh, interesting, because that's not a hunter-farmer thing. It's that's just, not a hunter-farmer. Yeah, it just depends uh, on whether you, you absorb it or excrete it. Here's, here's another one that people ask along those lines, is what about gluten? You know, gluten is one of these proteins found in three of the grains. It's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And it's very common to become allergic to it, but it doesn't seem to want to align according to hunter-farmer. Right. It would be great if all the people that were gluten-sensitive were hunters, and that's because they should be eating grain anyway. Right. But unfortunately, there's some farmers that could also be sensitive to gluten, and for them, they have to substitute. You know, they would be having corn, oats, and rice in place of the wheat, rye, and barley. It's yeah. simple substitution. Yeah, I think I'm one of those people. Okay, so what if grazing doesn't fill you up, someone asked. Yeah, no, grazing doesn't fill you up. That's the whole objective behind it. <laughs> And, you know, that's the problem. You know, losing weight requires something, and that is creating a calorie deficit. Right. No one's ever lost weight without burning more calories than they ingest. Yes. That's just a fact of life, unfortunately. Uh, but what people don't realize is our burning varies a lot. You know, our body's always adjusting its metabolism according to what we eat. Right. And so it's making the adjustment. Uh, so we have to be careful about what we eat because our body is trying to counteract that. Right. And what that means is, is that if you're hungry, you're probably losing weight. Yep. If you're full and you're not hungry, it's going to be very difficult to lose weight. That's not creating a calorie deficit. <laughs> so a certain amount of hunger comes with trying to lose weight. Yeah. If you're... If you're uh, a farmer, right? Uh, both. The farmers have more appetite, though. It's harder for them because they have more appetite. So they're struggling even more with losing weight. Okay, we have two minutes. Someone asked, if you have kidney disease, can the hunter-farmer book work? Uh, if you have kidney disease, can the hunter-farmer work? And the answer is yes. Um, most commonly with kidney disease, um, that's the hunter category more often. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because uh, the hunter is more prone to high blood pressure which is more likely to damage the kidneys. The hunter is more prone to diabetes, which of course affects kidney function. So if somebody has chronic kidney disease, they're more likely to be the hunter category. Mm -hmm. Now that would generally be a low grain, low sugar diet. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the one difference is that is also a diet that's relatively higher in protein, and some mm -hmm. chronic kidney patients are trying to be careful about too much protein. Right. And that means they're going to be getting relatively more fat in their diet than they would be getting protein or certainly carbohydrate. Right. But this could definitely work for somebody who has that condition. Right. Yes. Okay, the last question. Um, so I think this, the farmers are having questions out there because, of course, we want to graze. We don't want to graze. We want to eat a lot. We're programmed I to know, do that. I know. They're hungry, you know. <laughs> We're hungry we all the time. We eat a lot. We have to eat less. And we have to be a little bit hungry. So how can you, you know, not be unhappy being so hungry? Yes. And I think the answer is, look, you've got to learn to graze. Okay. Have a bite or two, you know. You don't have to eat the whole thing. Right. Have a bite or two. You know, have half of that entree. Bring half home. Right. You know, you might want to split that appetizer with somebody. Right. <laughs> um, think more in terms of saving some for later. Yes. Okay. I love it. All right. We actually thank you so much. And thank you listeners out there for incredibly great questions. Really, really good questions. We have uh, Dr. Mark Laponis talking about his book, The Hunter Farmer Diet Solution. Tell me your website again if folks wanted to. Uh, the website you can find at hunterfarmerdiet.com. Thank you Thank so you much, so for, much being for being here. Thanks, CJ. Next week, we're going to be having Thomas Moore talking about his classic book, Care of the Soul. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.